Hello, everyone. Welcome to theCUBE's coverage of AWS Startup Showcase. This is the closing panel session on AI machine learning, the top startups generating um, generate AI on AWS. It's a great panel. This is going to be the experts talking about riding the wave in generative AI. We got Ann Kermit Rutra, who's the director and general manager of AI and machine learning at AWS, and Clem Delang, co founder and CEO of Hugging Face, and Ori Goshen, who's the co founder and CEO of AI21 Labs. Uh, Ori, from from Tel Aviv dialing in and the rest coming in here on theCUBE. Appreciate you coming off with this closing session for the Startup Showcase. Thanks for having us. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited to have you all on. Hugging Face was recently in the news with the AWS relationship, so congratulations. Open source, open science, really driving the machine learning. And we got the AI21 labs, access to the LLMs, generating huge scale live applications, commercial applications coming to the market all powered by AWS. So everyone, congratulations on all your success and thank you for headlining this panel. Let's get right into it. Um, AWS is powering this wave here. We're seeing a lot of push here, okay, from applications. And Kirk, set the table for us on the AI machine learning. It's not, it's not new, it's been going on for a while. Past three years have been significant advancements, but there's been a lot of work done in AI machine learning. Now it's released to the public. Everybody's super excited. And now says, oh, the future's here. It's kind of been going on for a while and baking is now it's kind of coming out. What's your, what's your view here? Let's get it started. Yes, thank you. So yeah, um, you know, as you may be aware, Amazon has been uh, in investing in machine learning research and development since quite some time now. And uh, you know, we've used uh, machine learning to innovate and improve uh, user experiences across different Amazon products, whether it's Alexa or Amazon.com. But we've also uh, brought in um, our uh, expertise to to extend what we we're doing in the space and add more generative AI uh, technology to our AWS product and services, starting with uh, uh, Code Whisper, which is an AWS service that we announced uh, a few months ago. Uh, which is you can think of it as a as a coding companion uh, as a service uh, which uses generative AI uh, models underneath, and um, and so uh, so this this is a service that customers who have you know no machine learning expertise can just use, and um, we also are you know talking to customers and they we see a lot of excitement about generative AI and customers who want to build these these models themselves who have the talent and the expertise and resources, uh, for them, AWS has a number of different options and capabilities they can leverage, such as our custom uh, silicon, such as training, uh, Trainium and Intrinsia, as well as uh, distributed machine learning capabilities that we offer as part of uh, SageMaker, which is an end-to-end -end machine learning development um, service. Um, at the same time, many of our customers tell us that they're interested in you know, not training and building these generative AI models from scratch, given they can be ex expensive and can require, you know, specialized talent and skills to build. Um, and so for those uh, customers, we are also making it super easy to bring in existing um, generative AI models into their machine learning development environment within SageMaker for them to use. Um, so we recently announced our partnership with Hung Pace where we're making it super easy for customers to bring in those models uh, into their SageMaker development environment for fine tuning and deployment. Um, and then we're also uh, partnering with, um, you know, other um, proprietary model uh, providers such as uh, AI21 and others where uh, we're making these generative AI models available within SageMaker for our customers to use. So our approach here is to really provide customers options and choices and help them accelerate their generative AI journey. Anchor, thank you for setting the table there. Clem and Ori, I want to get your take because the riding the waves, the theme of this session. And to me, you know, being in California, I imagine the big surf, the big waves, the big talent <laughs> out there. This is like alpha geeks, alpha coders, developers are really leaning into this. You're seeing massive uptake from the smartest people, whether they're young or around, they're coming in with their kind of surf, surfboards, if you will. These early adopters, they've been on this for a while. Now the waves are hitting. This is a big wave. Everyone sees it. 
What are some of those early adopter devs doing? What are some of the use cases you're seeing right out of the gate? And, and what does this mean for the folks that are going to come in and, and get, get on this wave? Can you guys share your perspective on this? Because you're seeing the best talent now leaning into this. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, from Hugging Face vantage point, uh, it's not even a, a wave, it's, it's a tidal wave or, or maybe even the tide itself, right? Because actually what we're seeing is that, you know, AI and machine learning is not something that you add to your products. It's very much a new paradigm to do all technology, right? It's, it's this idea that uh, we had in the past 15, 20 years, one way to build software and to build technology, which was writing a million lines of code very rule-based, uh, and, and then you get your, your product. Now what we're seeing is that every single product, every single feature, every single company is starting to adopt AI to build the next generation of technology, right? Um, and that works both to make the existing use cases better, right? If you think of search, if you think of social network, if you think of SaaS, but also it's creating completely new capabilities that weren't possible with the previous paradigm, right? Now AI can generate text, it can generate image, it can describe your image, it can do so many new things that weren't, weren't possible before. It's going to really um, make the developer, so, it's going to really productive, right? I mean, you're seeing the developer uptake strong, right? Yes, we have uh, over 15,000 companies using Hugging Face now. Uh, and it keeps accelerating. Um, I, I really think that uh, maybe in like three, five years, um, there's not going to be any company not using AI. It's going to be really kind of like the default to build all technology. Ori, weigh in on this APIs, the cloud. Now I'm a developer. I want to have live applications. I want the commercial applications on this. What's your What's your take? What's weigh in on here? Weigh in here. Yeah, for, first I, I absolutely uh, agree. I mean, we're we're in this in the midst of uh, technology shift here. Uh, I think not a lot of people realize how big this how this big this uh, this is is going to be. Uh, just the uh, uh, a number of uh, possibilities is um, is endless and and uh, I think hard to imagine. And um, and uh, it's it's I don't think it's just the use cases. I think we can think of it as two separate categories. We'll see companies and products enhancing their offerings with these new AI capabilities, but we'll also see new companies um, that you know are AI first, that kind of reimagine certain experiences. They, they build something that wasn't possible before. And that's why I think it's actually extremely exciting times. And um, um, maybe more, uh, philosophically, I think now these uh, large language models and and and, and large transformer-based models are helping us people to uh, express our thoughts and, and and kind of making the bridge from our thinking to a creative digital asset in a speed we've never imagined before. Right, I can write something down and get a piece of text or an image or a code. Uh, so I think it really, uh, I, I started by saying, uh, it's hard to imagine all the possibilities right now, but it's cer certainly big. And uh, if, I had to, if I had to bet, I would say it's probably at least as big as the mobile revolution we've seen uh, in the last 20 years. Yeah, I mean, this is this is this is the biggest. I mean, it's been compared to the, you know, the Enlightenment age. I saw the Wall Street Journal had a recent story on this. We've been saying that this is probably going to be bigger than all inflection points combined in the tech industry, given what transformation is coming. I guess I want to ask you guys on the early adopters. We've been hearing on these interviews and throughout the industry that there's already a set of big companies, a set of companies out there that have a lot of data and they're already there. They're kind of tinkering. Kind of reminds me of the old hyperscaler days where they were building their own scale and they're, they're you know they're eating glass, spitting nails out. You know they're hardcore. Then you got everybody else kind of saying board level. Hey team, how do I leverage this? How do you see those two things coming together? You got the fast followers coming in behind the early adopters. What's it like for the second wave coming in? What are those conversations for those developers like? 
I mean, I think for me, the important switch for companies is to change their mindset from being kind of like a traditional software company to being an AI or machine learning company. Um, and that means investing, hiring machine learning engineers, machine learning scientists, uh, infrastructure team members who are um, working on how to put these models in, in production, uh, team members who are able to optimize models, specialized models, customize models for the company specific use cases. So it's really changing this, this mindset uh, of how you build technology uh, and optimize your company building around that. Um, things are moving so fast uh, that I think now um, it's kind of like too late for low hanging fruits or like small, small adjustments. I think it's important to realize that if you want to be good at that, and if you really want to serve this wave, you need, you need massive investments, right? Like for, if there are like some surfers uh, li listening with this analogy of the wave, right? When there are waves, uh, it's not enough just to stand and, and kind of make a little bit of adjustments. You need to, Position yourself aggressively, paddle like paddle like crazy, and that that's how you get into into the wave. So that's that's what companies, in my opinion, need to need to do right now. All right, what's your take on the um, the generative models out there? We hear a lot about foundation models. What's your experience running end to end applications for large foundation models? Any insights you can share with the app developers out there who are looking to get in? Yeah, I think first of all. Um, uh, it's, it's, it starts creating an economy where uh, it probably doesn't make sense for every company to create their own foundation models. I mean, you can basically start by using an existing foundation model, either open source or a proprietary one, and, and start deploying it for, for your needs. And then comes the second round when you're starting the optimization process, right? You, you bootstrap, whether it's a, it's a demo or a a small feature uh, or a, a new, introducing a new capability within your product and then start collecting data. That data, that data and particularly the human feedback data helps you to constantly uh, improve the model. So you create these uh, data flywheel. And I think uh, we're, we're now entering an era where uh, customers have a lot of uh, different choice of how they want to start their generative AI endeavor and uh, it's a good thing that there's um, you know there's there's a variety of uh, of, of choices um, and and the, the, the really amazing thing here is that every industry any company you speak with um, yeah it could be something you know very traditional like industrial or uh, financial or medical any really any company, uh, I think people now start to imagine what's what are the possibilities and uh, seriously think wh how how their what's their strategy for uh, adopting this generative AI technology and um, I think in that sense the, the foundation model will actually enable this to become scalable so um, uh, the barrier to entry became lower now the adoption could actually. Uh, accelerate. There's a lot of integration uh, aspects here in this new wave that's a little bit different. Before is like very monolithic, hardcore, very you know brittle. A lot more integration. You see a lot more data coming together. Um, I have to ask you guys on on as developers come in and grow. I mean, when I went to college. You were a software engineer. I mean, I got a degree in computer science and software engineering. That's all you did. Code, right? You did code it. Now, I mean, isn't it like? Everyone's a machine learning engineer at this point because like that will be ultimately the science. So, you know, uh, <laughs> you, know you got open source, you got open software, you got the communities, you know, M you know Swami called you guys the GitHub of machine learning, uh, hugging faces that get GitHub of machine learning, mainly because that's where people are going to code. So this, yeah. is, this is essentially machine learning is computer science. Is that, what do you guys, what's your reaction to that? Yes, my uh, my co-founder Julien at Tugging Face have, have been having this this thing for for quite a while now for for over three years, uh, which was was saying that uh, actually uh, um, software engineering as as we know it today is a subset of machine learning, uh, 
uh, instead of the other way around, right? Uh, people would call us kind of like crazy a few years ago when we, when we were seeing that. But now we're realizing that uh, you can actually uh, code with machine learning, right? So machine learning is, is generating code. Uh, and we're starting to see that uh, every software engineer can uh, can leverage machine learning through you know, open models, through APIs, through, through different different uh, technology technology stack. So yeah, it's not um, it's not crazy anymore to think that maybe in a few years there's going to be more people doing AI and machine learning, however you call it, right? Maybe you'll still call them software engineers, maybe you'll call them machine learning engineers, yeah. but there might be more of these people in a couple of years than there is like software software engineers today. I bring this up. Um, I bring this up as more tongue in cheek as well, because Anchor and Infrastructure as Co is what made cloud great, right? That's the kind of the DevOps movement. But here, the shift is so massive. There will be a game-changing philosophy around coding, machine learning as code. You're starting to see Code Whisperer. You guys have had coding companions for a while on AWS. Um, so this is a paradigm shift. How is the cloud playing into this for you guys? Because you know, to me, I've been riffing on, the, on some interviews where it's like, okay, you got the cloud going next level. This is an example of that, where there is a DevOps-like moment happening with machine learning, whether you call it coding or whatever, it's writing code on its own. Can you guys comment on what this means on top of the cloud? What, what comes out of the scale? What comes out of the benefit here? Absolutely. Well, first, so, oh, go ahead. Yeah, so I was, um, I think, as far as scale is concerned, I think customers are really relying on on uh, on cloud to make sure that um, the applications that they build um, can can scale along with the, the the needs of their business. But there's another aspect to it, um, which is that you know until a few years ago, John, what we saw was that machine learning was a data scientist heavy activity. There were data scientists who were taking the data and training models. And then as uh, machine learning found its way more and more into, into production and actual usage, we saw um, you know, the MLOps um, uh, become a thing and MLOps engineers become more involved in, in, into the process. And then uh, we now are seeing, you know, as machine learning is being used to solve more critical business critical problems, we're seeing even legal and compliance teams get involved. We're seeing business stakeholders more, more engaged um, so more and more um, uh, machine learning is becoming an activity that's not just performed by data scientists, but is performed by a, a team uh, and a group of people with different skills. And, 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 um, uh, and for, for them, uh, we as AWS are focused on providing the best uh, tools and services for these different personas to be able to do their job and, and really uh, complete that end-to-end -end, uh, machine learning story. So. That's where whether it's tools for uh, related to ML ops or even for um, for 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 folks who you know don't know any uh, cannot code or don't know any machine learning. For example, we launched uh, SageMaker Canvas as a tool um, last year, which you can just use. Um, which is a UI based tool, which uh, you know data analysts and business analysts can use to build machine learning models. So overall, the the spectrum in terms of persona and who can get involved in the machine learning process is, is expanding and uh, the cloud is playing a big role in that process. Ori Clem, can you guys weigh in too? Cause this is just another abstraction layer of scale. What's it mean for you guys as you look forward to your, your customers and the use cases that you're enabling? Yes, I think it's uh, what's important is that, uh, you know, the AI companies and providers and, and, and the cloud kind of like work, work together, right? That's, that's how you make kind of like a seamless experience and you actually reduce the barrier to, to entry for, for this technology. Um, so that's what we've been super happy to do with, uh, with AWS for, for the past few years. We actually announced not too long ago uh, that we're doubling down on our partnership with uh, with AWS. Um, we're excited to uh, have many many customers on our shared product, the Hugging Face Deep Learning Container on on SageMaker, uh, and we're working really closely with the with the Inferentia team and the Trinium team uh, to release some more exciting stuff in the coming coming weeks and coming coming months. So I think when you when you have an ecosystem and a system where you know the 
AWS and the AI providers, AI startups can kind of like work hand in hand. It's um, it's to the benefit of the customers and of the companies because it makes it like uh, orders of magnitude easier for them to adopt this this new paradigm to build technology AI. Or this is a scale yeah. issue on reasoning too. You got the, the data's out there and making sense out of it, making it reason, making getting comprehension, having having it make decisions is next, isn't it? And you need scale for that. Yes. Uh, just a comment about the, the infrastructure side. So I think really the purpose is to make, to streamline and, and make these technologies much more accessible. And I think we'll see, uh, I predict that we'll see in the next uh, uh, next few years, more and more tooling that um, uh, make this uh, technology much more uh, simple to consume. And, um, and I think it plays a very important uh, role. There's so many aspects like the uh, uh, monitoring the models uh, and their kind of outputs they produce and, um, and kind of con containing and, and running them, um, you know, in production environment, there's so much there to build that the infrastructure side will, will play a very significant role. All right, that's awesome stuff. And I'd love to change gears a little bit and get a little philosophy here around AI and how it's going to transform. If you guys don't mind, um, there's been a lot of conversations around on the cube here, as well as in some industry areas where it's like, okay, all the heavy lifting is automated away with machine learning and AI, the complexity, there's some efficiencies, it's horizontally scalable across all industries. Anchor, good point there. Everyone's going to use it for something. And, and there's a lot of bringing, a lot of stuff gets brought to the table with large language models and other things. But the key ingredient will be proprietary data or human input or some sort of, you know, AI whisper or kind of role or prompt engineering people are saying. So with that being said, some are saying it's automating intelligence and that creativity will be unleashed from this. Um, if the heavy lifting goes away, and AI can fill the void, that shifts the value to the intellect or the input. And so that means data's got to come together, interact, fuse and understand each other. This is kind of new. I mean, old, old school AI was, okay, got a big model, I provisioned it long time, very expensive. Now it's all free flowing. Can you guys comment on where you see this going with this free form, data flowing everywhere, heavy lifting and then specialization? Or yeah, I think. Go ahead. Yeah, I think I think uh, so. What we're seeing with these uh, large language models or generative models is that they're really good at cre creative stuff. Um, uh, but they, I think, it's also important to recognize their limitations. Um, they're uh, they're not as good at reasoning and logic. And um, I think now we're seeing. We're seeing great enthusiasm, I think, uh, uh, which is uh, justified. And uh, the next phase would would be how to make these systems more reliable, how to inject more reasoning capabilities into these models or augment with other mechanisms that actually perform more reasoning so we can achieve more uh, reliable results and we can count on these models to perform in, you know, for critical tasks, whether, whether it's, you know, medical tasks, legal tasks, we really want to kind of uh, offload a lot of the intelligence to these um, systems. And, um, and then, and then we ha we'll have to get back, we'll have to make sure these are reliable, we'll have to make sure we, we get some sort of explainability that these, these, we can understand the process behind the, the, the generated results that we received. So um, I think I'm, this is kind of the next, the next phase of uh, systems that are based on, on, on these generative models. Clem, what's your view on this? Obviously you're at open community, open source has been around. It's been a great track record, proven model. I'm assuming yeah. creativity is going to come out of the woodwork and if we can automate open source contribution and, and relationships, and onboarding more developers, there's going to be unleashing of creativity. Yes, it's been uh, it's been so exciting on the on the open source front, front right? Like uh, we we all know uh, Bert, you know Bloom, GPTJ, T5, Stable Diffusion, uh, that that were kind of like the the previous or like the current generation of open source models that are on Hugging Face. 
it's it has been accelerating in the past uh, in the past few months, right? Uh, so like I'm I'm super excited about uh, control net right now that is really uh, um, having a lot of impact, which which is kind of like a, a way to control the generation of of images. Uh, super excited about Flan UL2, which is like a new model that has been re recently uh, recently released and and is open source. Uh, so it's it's uh, yeah, it's really fun to see the the ecosystem coming coming together. Um, open source has been the basis for you know uh, traditional software, right? With like open source programming languages, of of course, but also all the great open source that we've gotten over the years. Um, so we're happy to see that the same thing is is happening for for machine learning and, and AI, and hopefully it can kind of like uh, help uh, a lot of companies reduce a little bit the, the barrier to 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 entry. Um, so yeah, it's it's going to be exciting to see how it evolves in the next uh, next few years in that respect. I think the developer productivity angle that's been talked about a lot in, in the industry will be accelerated significantly. I think security will be enhanced by this. I think in general applications are going to transform at a radical rate, accelerating incredible rate. So I think it's a it's not a, not a, it's not a big wave or it's just not it's the water, right? I mean it's not it's the, it's the new thing. Uh, my final question for you guys, if you don't mind, I'd love to get each of you to, to answer the question I'm going to ask you, which is, you know, a lot of conversations around um, data data infrastructure is obviously involved in this. And the common thread that I'm hearing is that every company that looks at this is asking themselves, if we don't rebuild our company, start thinking about rebuilding our business model around AI, we might be dinosaurs, we might be extinct. And it reminds me of that scene in Moneyball when at the end it's like, if we're not building the model around your model, every company will be out of business. What's your advice to companies out there that are, that are having those kind of like moments where it's like, okay, this is real, this is next gen, this is happening. I better start thinking and putting into motion plans to refactor my business because it's happening. Business transformation is happening on the cloud. This kind of puts an exclamation point on with the AI as a next step function, big, big increase in value. So it's an opportunity for, for leaders. Anchor, we'll start with you. What's your advice folks out there thinking about this? Do they put their toe in the water? Do they jump right into the deep end? What's your advice? Yeah, Sean, so, you know, we talk to a lot of customers and, uh, you know, customers are uh, excited about uh, what's happening in the space, but they often ask us like, hey, where do we start? So we all, uh, you know, always advise our customers to do a lot of uh, proof of concepts, understand where, you know, they can drive the biggest uh, ROI. And, uh, and then also leverage, you know, um, existing tools and services uh, to move to move fast and scale and and try and you know not reinvent the wheel uh, where where it doesn't need to be. So um, that's that's basically uh, the our advice to customers. Get in, Ori. What's your what's your advice to folks who are yeah, scratching their head going, I better jump in here. What? How do I get started? What's your advice? Yeah, so I, I actually think that I need to be think about it really economically. So uh, both on the opportunity side and the challenges. So uh, there's a lot of opportunities for many companies to actually gain uh, revenue upside by building these new generative uh, features and capabilities. On the other hand, of course, this would uh, probably affect the COGS and uh, incorporating these capabilities could probably affect the COGS. So I think we need, really need to think carefully about both, both of these sides and um, also understand clearly if this is um, a project or um, an effort towards cost reduction, then the ROI is pretty clear or, or revenue uh, amplifier where there's, a, again, a lot of different opportunities. So I think once, once you want to um, uh, think about this in a structured way, I think, and, and map the different initiatives, um, then it's uh, it's probably a good a good way to start and a good way to start thinking about these uh, endeavors. Awesome, Clem. What's your take on this? What's your advice, folks out there? Yes, all all of these are very very good advice uh, already. Uh, something that that you said before, John, that I, I disagree a little bit. A lot of people are are talking about you know like the data mode and and proprietary proprietary data. Um, 
actually, when, when you look at some of the organizations that are build, building the best models, they don't have uh, specialized or like unique access, access to data. So I'm not sure that's so important today. I think what's important for companies, um, and it's been the same for the previous generation of technology, is their ability to build better technology faster than others, right? And this in this new paradigm, that means you know being able to build machine learning faster than others and and better. Um, so that that's how, in my opinion, you should approach this, right? In kind of like how can you um, evolve your company, your teams, your products, so that you are able in the long run to build machine learning better and faster than your competitors. And if you manage to put yourself in, in that situation, then that, that's when you'll be able to differentiate yourself to really kind of like uh, be impactful and, and, and get, get results. That's really hard to do, right? It's, it's something really, really different because machine learning and AI is, is a different paradigm than traditional software. Um, so this is going to be challenging, but I think if you manage to nail that, um, then um, the, the future is going to be very interesting for, for your company. That's a great point. Thanks for, thanks for calling that out. I think it all reminds me of the cloud days early on. If you went to the cloud early, you took advantage of it. when the pandemic hit, if you weren't native in the cloud, you got hamstrung by that, you were flat footed. So just get in there, <laughs> get in the cloud, get in, get into AI. You're going to be good. Um, thanks for, for calling that. Uh, final parting uh, comments. Uh, what's your, most exciting thing going on right now for you guys, uh, Ori Clem. What's what's uh, what's the most exciting thing on your plate right now that you'd like to share with folks? So, I mean, I for me, it's just the the diversity of uh, of use cases and um, uh, really creative ways of companies leveraging this technology. Uh, every day, I speak with uh, about two three customers and. Uh, I, I'm uh, continuously being surprised by the uh, cr creative ideas and, um, and, and the future is really exciting of what can be achieved here. And also I'm, I'm, I'm amazed by the pace that things move in this industry. Um, it's just, there's no, not a dull moment. So uh, definitely exciting times. Clem, what are you most excited about right now? For me, it's like all the new open source models that have been released in the past past few weeks, and that they'll keep being released in the in the next uh, next few weeks. I'm also super excited about more and more companies getting into this uh, uh, capability of uh, chaining different models and different different APIs. I think that's a very very interesting development because it it creates new capabilities, new possibilities, new functionalities that weren't possible before. You can, you know, plug a, an API with like a, an open source embedding model with like an audio transcription model. Um, so that's that's also very exciting. This capability of uh, having more uh, interoperable uh, machine learning will also, I think, open a lot of uh, interesting things in the in the future. Clem, congratulations on your success at Hugging Face. Please pass that on to your team. Ori, congratulations Thanks. on your success and continue to just day one. I mean, it's just the beginning, it's not even scratching the surface. Anchor, I'll give you the last word. What are you excited for there at AWS? More cloud goodness coming uh, here uh, with AI. I'll give you the final word. Yeah, so, you know, as, as both Clem and Ori said, I think the, the research in the space is moving really, uh, really fast. So we are excited about that, but we, um, you know, we're also excited to see uh, the speed at which um, enterprises and other AWS customers are applying machine learning to solve real business problems and the and the kind of results they're seeing. Um, so when they, you know, come back to us and tell us the kind of uh, improvement in their business metrics and, and overall customer experience that they're driving and they're seeing real business results, that's what, you know, keeps us going and, and inspires us to um, you know, to continue inventing on their behalf. Gentlemen, thank you so much for this awesome high impact panel. Anchor Clem, 
Ori, congratulations on all your success. We'll, we'll see you around. Thanks for coming on. Generative AI, riding the wave. It's a tidal wave. It's the water. It's all happening. All great stuff. This is season three, episode one of 80 of a Startup Showcase, closing panel. This is the AI ML episode, the top startups building generative AI on AWS. I'm John Furrier, your host. Thanks for watching. Thank you.